Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. I was recently contacted by a lady by the name of Fiona, or Fee, who has been a subscriber to the Crime Reel for quite a while now. She is a regular commenter on the channel and you may well know her as Pimpozza. She's originally from the UK but now lives in Italy and has very kindly written this week's true crime narration. Whilst this case received a great deal of attention from the Italian press, it appears to be relatively unknown outside of Italy. So today we shall be looking at the bizarre case of the disappearance of 15 year old Sara Scarzi. Sara's mother was on live TV appealing for her daughter's safe return when she learned a horrific truth about what had happened to Sara. An entire nation was left reeling in shock and this, without doubt, is one of the most controversial cases in recent Italian history. In the far south of Italy, in the county of Puglia, the heel of the country, lies a little town named Avatrana. With just 6,700 residents, it is a small, ordinary town like so many others, with surrounding farmland, agricultural productivity and easy access to the sea. It is a peaceful place where residents go about their daily lives at a calm and gentle pace. Before August of 2010, few people had even heard of it, but all of that changed when 15-year-old Sara Scarzi suddenly vanished into thin air and Avatrana was firmly placed on the map. It was on a typically hot, sunny afternoon on the 26th of August 2010 that Sara left her home to walk the few hundred metres to the house of her older cousin, 22-year-old Sabrina Masseri. The two young women planned to spend a few hours at the beach, along with another friend, Mariangela. Sabrina and Sara had grown up practically next door to each other and were very close. Sabrina described Sara as more like a little sister than a cousin and had taken Sara under her wing from the moment she was born. They saw each other every other day. In fact, Sara spent more time at Sabrina's house than she did at her own. If Sara felt anxious about anything, Sabrina would comfort her. They had meals together, would laugh at each other's jokes, discuss their problems, go into town or for a splash in the sea. As she grew up, Sara would accompany her older cousin to the pub where she loved to mingle with Sabrina's older friends and drink Coca-Cola. Sara never showed up at Sabrina's house on that fateful afternoon and telephone calls went unanswered. Sabrina raised the alarm and Sara's mother, Conchetta Serrano, quickly reported her daughter's disappearance. Conchetta said her family came home from shopping, went to her room for around 15 minutes, grabbed a bite to eat, fetched a beach towel and left the house in plenty of time to meet Sabrina at 2.30pm. Sabrina claimed, which phone records would later verify, that she sent two text messages to her cousin. One was at 2.25pm telling her to get her swimsuit on and another at 2.28pm asking, did you get the message? At 2.42pm, Sarah's phone was switched off and the young girl disappeared into thin air. The news quickly generated enormous media attention and the sleepy little town of Avitrana became known to the entire country overnight. From the beginning, media focus was on Sarah's personal life and habits, scouring her Facebook profile and secret diary for any clues as to why the teenager might have run away from home. She was portrayed as a restless young girl who regularly contacted older boys on social media. Newspapers reported how she was desperate for excitement and longed to escape her mundane life in such a small village that offered so little for youngsters of her age. It was reported that Sara was saddened by the fact that her father was constantly away working and that she was oppressed by a devout Jehovah's Witness mother with whom she frequently quarrelled. Her mother, friends and family emphatically denied this image of Sara. Instead, they insisted she must have been kidnapped despite the family's frugal economic situation. In a crescendo of media interest, Sarah's family, particularly her cousin Sabrina, appeared on many television broadcasts, appealing for Sarah's safe return home. The utterly inconsolable Sabrina regularly made tearful appeals, begging the guilty party to come forward and release the kidnapped girl if they had any ounce of conscience. 
After more than a month of searching, on the 29th of September 2010, Sarah's partially burned mobile phone was found in a field not far from her home by her uncle, Sabrina's father, Michali Masseri. Michali told the police that he had recognised the phone instantly by the distinctive Coca-Cola stickers that were attached. Michali showed deep pain and anguish and was determined to find his niece, who he claimed he had helped to raise and loved her like she was his own daughter. Born in Manduria, in the province of Taranto in March 1954, Michali was a farmer who worked in the surrounding fields of his hometown. Amongst expanses of olive groves and prickly pears, he was described as a pious, timid man who lived a simple life with his family. With a hat pulled down over his ears and sunburnt hands, Michali had appeared rather shy in front of the cameras when pressed by the journalists to answer questions about his missing niece, the girl he claimed he and his wife, Cosima, had raised as a third daughter. From his first TV appearance, he invoked feelings of tenderness amongst the viewing public and became fondly referred to as Uncle Mikali. However, after the discovery of Sarah's burnt phone, suspicion began to grow and 57-year-old Macaulay was brought in for questioning on the 6th of October 2010. The interrogation lasted for hours and resulted in an extremely disturbing confession. This seemingly kindly, timid uncle who the nation had taken to their hearts confessed to the murder of his niece claiming to have strangled her in his garage after an attempted sexual assault. He further admitted to an additional offence against Sarah after she had died. Mikali indicated where Sarah could be found and subsequently investigators were led to an area in the countryside of Avitrana, where indeed the poor girl's decomposing remains were discovered immersed in water at the bottom of a well. During this long interrogation, Sarah's mother, Conchetta, was being interviewed on a live TV programme, Kila Visto. It translates as, Who's Seen Them? As news came in, the presenter told Conchetta directly that her brother-in-law had just confessed to killing Sarah. Viewers were left disgusted, speechless and totally appalled. Conchetta's anguish over her missing daughter had gripped the nation for weeks and over three and a half million people had tuned in to watch the programme live as she appealed to the public for information, hoping for Sarah's safe return. Viewing figures soared to five million as the news continued. To make matters worse, the live interview was taking place directly from the home of Conchetta's brother-in-law at the same time that he was confessing to the appalling crime. The helpless mother looked totally shocked and said she simply could not believe Mikali was capable of such a thing. Attempts to call him were in vain as he was unable to answer his phone having been detained by the police. A disorientated Conchetta was seen by millions as she tried to make phone calls and struggled to make sense of what she was hearing. The whole scenario turned into a public spectacle. It wasn't until eight minutes later that Conchetta was asked if she would like to end the interview, to which she replied, yes please. However, the broadcast still continued for a further three minutes and was later heavily criticised for having allowed the distraught mother to learn such horrific news from a journalist in front of an audience of millions when she could so easily have been told privately off air. The channel controller defended the actions of the Kila Visto team by saying, The programme tried to manage a tragic affair in the most delicate way possible and I believe the presenter achieved this. However, the actions were later described as totally insensitive and a barbaric invasion of someone's grief. Turning the tragic death of a daughter into a huge spectacle was deemed disturbing and chilling. A tearful Sabrina swiftly appeared on TV once again, condemning her father for his actions, yet claiming to still love him as she found it hard to believe he was guilty. In a bizarre twist, it turned out that he most likely wasn't. In a new turn of events, the Italian public were once again astounded when just a few days later, Michele retracted his statement. Now declaring his innocence, he instead pointed the finger at his own daughter, Sabrina, the adoring older cousin who had openly wept in despair in front of the television cameras. Michele told police he had wanted to take the blame at first, but that in truth, Sabrina had killed Sarah the crime happened in the garage during a discussion which then turned into a fight. 
Sabrina had then called him asking for help disposing of Sarah's body. In fact, the police already had their doubts about Mikali's initial confession based on other witness statements at the time. Mikali had not done a convincing job of explaining exactly how he had ended Sarah's life or what he had used to choke her. He said he killed his niece in the garage, but his version of events kept changing and little of what he said matched up with what the investigation team had uncovered. Also, the autopsy did not show that Sarah had been violated post-mortem. In addition, Sabrina had apparently been all too eager to profess to her friend, Mariangela, that Sarah had been kidnapped, panicking and behaving irrationally when hardly any time had passed since Sarah's actual disappearance. A local florist also claimed to have seen Sarah being forced into a car by Sabrina and her mother, Cosima, though the florist later stated that he might have dreamt this. Irrespective, this evidence would later become admissible in court. Sabrina was quickly arrested and it was determined that the motive for the murder was jealousy and that she had strangled Sarah in a fit of rage. It was believed that although the cousins had always been close, Sarah was now maturing into a slim, pretty young teen who was interested in boys and 22-year-old Sabrina was suffering with insecurities about her own weight and appearance and was feeling inferior. Sabrina had befriended a 27-year-old chef from Avitrana named Ivano Russo, with whom she was totally smitten. Sara and Sabrina would often meet up with Ivano, and he later claimed to be friendly with both girls, but stated that he wasn't interested in taking the relationship with Sabrina any further than friendship. It was alleged that Sabrina was madly in love with Ivano, and was insanely jealous of the attention he paid to 15-year-old Sara. Sabrina began to blame her younger cousin for her doomed relationship with the chef, Apparently, Sarah had told others, including her older brother, Claudio, who lived in Milan, about the fact that Sabrina kept making unwanted advances towards Ivano. Sarah had also written in her diary how Sabrina would get mad at her when they were out with Ivano, accusing her of always being by his side. In such a small town, this fueled local gossip about Sabrina's character and she felt ridiculed and infuriated. It was alleged that this led to an extreme hatred and anger towards her young cousin. Sabrina fiercely denied the accusations, now totally blaming her father for the crime and voicing great shock and anger over his allegations. An entire nation was left in disbelief at how events were unfolding in one of the most bizarre crimes in decades. Many believed it had to be Uncle Mikali. Others thought more family members must be involved, especially as Sabrina's mother, Cosima, was also now under suspicion after the florist claimed to have seen her push Sarah into her car. Subsequently, on May 26, 2011, Cosima was also arrested on charges of complicity to murder. Phone records prove that she made a call from her mobile phone in the garage where Sarah was strangled. Cosima had previously denied being in the garage that afternoon. Meanwhile, Sara's heartbroken mother, Conchetta, had to suffer the anguish of having lost her beloved daughter, whilst at the same time having to come to terms with the possibility that it may not have been her brother-in-law, but her own sister and niece who had committed the murder. To make matters even more sinister, both Cosima and Sabrina had constantly been at Conchetta's side, comforting her during the weeks of turmoil and grief that she faced when her daughter had disappeared. Conchetta begged for the truth, but a seemingly close family was now firmly at war and chaos and confusion abounded. The authorities, however, were convinced that they had the true perpetrators and vowed that they would be brought to justice. The trial opened before the court of Taranto on the 10th of January 2012. The defendants, Sabrina Maseri, accused of voluntary murder, her mother, Cosima, accused with complicity in murder, and her father, Mikali, accused of disposing of a corpse. It was alleged by the prosecutors that Sarah's death occurred between 2pm and 2.15pm on the 26th of August 2010. It was determined that a violent quarrel broke out between the two cousins and Sarah fled. At that point, Sabrina's mother, Cosima, apparently intervened and along with Sabrina chased Sarah in their Opal Astra 
and forced Sara into the car. Returning to the house, Sara was strangled with a belt and her body left in the integral garage. McCarley was then ordered to dispose of the corpse and make Sarah's personal effects disappear. It's all over, he apparently said to his wife during a phone call to her at 3.25pm. In a hearing on December 5th, 2012, whilst responding to questions from Sabrina's lawyer, McCarley once again confessed in tears to the murder of his young niece, claiming he was the only one involved. This prompted his own lawyer to resign and proceedings were suspended whilst a new lawyer could be found. On the 20th of April 2013, Sabrina and Cosima were both found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Sara Scarzi. Life in Italy actually means a minimum of 21 years. Appeals were overturned and the sentences upheld in July 2015 and February 2017. Mikali received eight years for helping to dispose of a corpse. Mikali attended craft courses in prison and said he hoped to return to farming after his release from jail in June 2021. Sabrina and Cosima share a cell in Taranto prison and work as seamstresses. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they were assigned to making and packing face masks. They both strongly proclaim their innocence to this day. Some feel that there was a gross miscarriage of justice and that both mother and daughter are innocent, being found guilty only on circumstantial evidence when there was, in fact, a great deal of reasonable doubt. Sabrina's lawyer, Professor Franco Coppi, describes her as a victim and says he will never rest until he proves her innocence. He claims the idea of jealousy is a ridiculous fabrication as Sabrina was happy to take Sara along whenever they met up with Ivano Russo. Professor Coppi states, Sabrina is innocent, as is Cosima. By his own admission, the person responsible is Macaulay and the motive for the crime is sexual. I live with the fear of going to my grave without having been able to prove her innocence. Sabrina is another victim of the Avitrana crime and it is a weight that I now carry in my heart every day. It was also claimed that the florist's testimony of having seen Sabrina and her mother push Sara into the car and then claiming he might have dreamt it should have never been admissible as evidence in court. Others, including well-known Italian criminologist Roberta Brizzoni, insist there is no doubt whatsoever as to who the true culprits are, and they are firmly behind bars. Brizzoni states that Sabrina has a very narcissistic personality and lies easily without giving anything away. She plays a role in front of the cameras and effortlessly manages to deal with the media. Typical of a manipulative personality, she says. She goes on to state that Mikali only became involved after he had been told about the death of his young niece. Cosima was the head of that family, she insists. She dictated the orders and he, being subordinate, would never dream of going against her. He covered his wife and daughter for this terrible crime. More than 11 years later, this case remains shrouded in mystery and doubt and is still regularly debated. One of the most contentious and macabre crime cases in the Italian news. Yet the one person who knows what really happened can never tell us. Poor young Sara Scarzi, whose life was suddenly and brutally taken away from her on that hot summer's day in Puglia. That concludes today's story. I would just like to say thank you once again to Fiona or Pimpozza for supplying the script for today. I'd love to work with you again if possible. If anyone else would like to get involved with something similar, please get in touch. Please add comments down below. And if you aren't subscribed yet, please click the subscribe button. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, even Sabrina's sister, Veronica, firmly believes that both her mother and sister are innocent and is convinced their father is the true culprit. However, the majority of Italians believe justice prevailed. Ciao.